I normally like to make the point that um, they're called hallucinogenic drugs, but they very, very rarely cause full-blown hallucinations, you know, like a proper full-blown hallucination. They, they normally induce very striking perceptual distortions. Um, we, talk, we heard a little bit before about changes in mystical experiences and altered sense of self that also go into a little bit more. Um, also very strongly influenced by personal environmental context. This can, I think, be one of the, um, the, the potential downsides. And, and I think this is important here. These drugs are non-toxic and non-addictive. But at the same time, I, you know, I don't think it's right to be saying, you know, my personal view is that it's not right that, that it's impossible to have a bad experience. Um, certainly in, in some of my own research, there were people that had bad experiences, but it was always relating to these personal environmental contexts. Um, Anyway, I'll go on. So I also like this example for those that have not taken any of these substances before. Um, I, I do vision research, so I think this is a very a nice illustration of how you can end up... Um, motion is such a powerful part of the experience, in the sense of to move and, and um, oscillate. But the idea that you can have motion without the movement of an object, I think is actually quite hard to conceptualise. Um, except if you see something like this, then obviously they're the types of experience that um, the people have. And these are the sorts of, of things that I was looking at a little bit more. Okay, so I think, if, I think it's interesting. My, I should go backwards and say my personal interest beyond the use of psilocybin is um, trying to understand how the natural neurotransmitters in the brain impact perception, <coughs> cognition, and so from my perspective, psilocin is, is interesting in that it causes these types of uh, well, extremely profound, extreme, I should say, not pro anyway, um, extreme effects on the brain in terms of perception, altering perception, everything that you might think to be, your, to be who you are. Um, but what I find quite interesting is about this is that they share very similar chemical structures with LSD and D DMT and a very... Um, important component of these drug effects seems to be their ability to bind to the serotonin 2A receptor. Now, um, within the brain, there's a lot of different neurotransmitters that are floating around. You, know, you probably all heard of dopamine and noradrenaline and there's glutamate and there's GABA, there's lots of different things. Within serotonin system alone, there's a lot of receptors, a lot of different receptor subtypes. Now, a few years ago when I was doing this research, it was thought that um, psilocybin really only activated the serotonin 2A and 1A receptor, but I said that now it's been updated to include many more. But I think it's this, it's this serotonin 2A receptor that's it's particularly interesting. The, the drugs that activate the serotonin 2A receptor generally cause hallucin hallucinations. Drugs that block the 2A receptor generally block hallucin hallucinations. Um, and so, if you're interested in consciousness, that's what I'm interested in, separate to, to hallucinogenic drugs. If you've got a drug that is, if you've got a receptor that seems to be selectively causing hallucinations when that receptor is activated, to me that's extremely interesting. That receptor's there in the brain of every single person, regardless of whether or not they're taking hallucinogenic drugs. So, I'm particularly interested in what's that receptor doing most of the time. Um, anyway. So we heard a little bit before about the, the previous use of um, psilocybin in the lab. So I, I might skip through this a little bit in terms of what was done in the past with the um, LSD psychotherapy. I do think it, we, we heard um, in terms of alcohol treatment, I, I, I do think it's worth noting that it doesn't always work. The LSD used experimentally to treat schizophrenia did not have particularly great outcomes. Um, I think it was, it was found that hallucinogenic drugs do not help hallucinogen people that experience hallucinogenic symptoms most of the time. Um, so, but it, it, anyway, I think, I think it's Im important to, to look back at what has been done and what has been learned. So at that time, we also had Timothy Leary conducting the Good Friday experiments, which you're probably familiar with. Now, I went back today and had a bit of a look on Google, not Google, PubMed, to find out what was, uh, what's been published in the last few years, because I know there's a lot of research that's been done at the moment. Um, I was particularly intrigued to see that the, the most recent paper 
effects of hallucinogens, no, the effects of psilocybin is looking in zebrafish models, testing the pharmacology and toxicology, and the whole paper was explaining why zebrafish are the most appropriate animal to be testing hallucinogenic drugs on. Just thought that was, thought that was interesting, but anyway. Um, so recent studies have looked at cluster headaches, but in 2015, you know, there was really a huge number of, of studies. And I know one of the goals of this current sort of forum is to talk about um, potentially doing these types of experiments, but I think it's, it's interesting or noteworthy that there's actually a lot of research being done around the world with, with psilocybin particularly. Um, so it's a cluster headaches, but there's also a, another study looking at re reduced threat, um, reduces in threat induced modulation of amygdala activity in humans, looking at spiritual experiences, reduced psychological distress and suicidality, changes in ego dissolution, alcohol dependence, face perception, obsessive compulsive disorder, tobacco addiction, and a whole stack of extra studies that were just basically brain imaging studies. So there are a lot of groups in the world doing this type of research in the, in the very recent um, past. Okay, so the work I'm going to talk a little bit in greater depth is the, some of the stuff that I was involved with personally. So this was work done with Franz Vollenweider and at the time the uh, postdoc, Felix Hassler, who I believe is not, no longer there, but he was the um, really the senior postdoc that was involved in a lot of these early studies. Now they, in this lab they have two main uh, goals and one is to model psychosis. I think a lot of their funding initially came from, from this arm of the research and basically uh, the idea was being, well, if you can induce a psychosis-like state in an otherwise healthy, healthy person, then we can try and understand um, how psychosis is being generated in a, in a person that's unwell. Um, they also ran a range of studies, I think they're still doing this, where they give people hallucinogenic drugs in combination with an antipsychotic medication to see which effects are blocked and, and this type of thing. Um, and I, I see there's a number of papers coming out from that lab sort of every year. So the, the other use is, is a much more a basic research uh, purpose, uh, looking at psych psychopharmacology, using these drugs to understand the role of the natural neurotransmitters in healthy perception and cognition. And that was completely uh, my interest and, and why I ended up in this lab. Um, so I'm going to talk relatively briefly, but I'll go through one of the experiments that I did in great detail, I'll just explain exactly what we did. Um, but I also ran a number of other studies looking at things like binocular rivalry, I don't know if you're familiar with these things, or you know, working memory and attention. But I like, quite like this study because it, it's relatively um, sort of uh, concrete in its findings and, and hopefully easy to relate to. So. We gave people uh, doses of psilocybin. I'll go into a bit more detail later about the different doses and the effects. But during, these, um, during the experiments, we asked people to make judgments about a simple motion stimulus. Okay? So in the first case, there was a very boring um, breaking, moving to the left or to the right. And, um, as the trial, if they got it correct, it, the next trial it became harder. And the way it became harder was that the little black and white bars became closer to grey. So, <coughs> sorry, after multiple trials, especially if they're doing well, this becomes just noise, right? So the, the idea is how sensitive is their um, very early visual processing in terms of motion perception. Then we had a second uh, type of stimulus which involved a lot of random dots, black and white dots. In the, in the first instance, they were moving coherently together, left or right, and as you get harder and harder, if people were doing um, well, they basically, the, the proportion of dots that were moving randomly increased. Now, sorry. <coughs> um, people, healthy people, not taking hallucinogenic drugs, can do this with very small proportion of coherent dots. So normally if there's like 3% coherence, you get this very nice view of, it like, looks like transparency, it looks like a film moving across a background of, of noisy dots, okay? Um, 
So that's coherent motion. Now, why was I using these tasks? So there's four reasons why we thought this would be interesting. <coughs> One is a simple anatomical reason. Um, a lot has been done looking at these particular tasks in terms of normal vision, um, and it's quite clear that the area, the, the very earliest stages of visual processing in V1 is capable of uh, resolving these types of tasks, okay? But not these types of tasks. So the integration of individual motion signals, when you've got random dots moving everywhere, the only way you can work out the 3% of the dots are moving to left or to right is by binding those disparate um, dots into a coherent percept. Now, it's pretty well accepted that that cannot be done at V1 requires the next stage up of processing at, at, at MT. Um, okay, so in terms of a hierarchy, it's, it was, it's nice to say, okay, you've got the individual motion elements, now we've got to stick them together. So we wanted to see if the, the effects of, <coughs> of psilocybin were selective to, to um, either of these two mechanisms. So from a very sort of functional perspective, in terms, it's often reported the people that take these drugs, they report that things are brighter. Okay, they're, they're stronger, they're brighter, they can, they can see better, somehow there's a, a, there are self-reports of improved functionality and we just wanted to test that psychophysically in the lab. Um, now clinically, this was also interesting because coherent motion, but not, so this is this task here, but not contrast detection is impaired schizophrenia. Now, as an aside, I've just finished, we've just sent off a publication, a study looking at this. We've, we've replicated that finding, but shown in, in 200 um, clinical psychiatric patients that it's not specific to schizophrenia, but rather specific to psychosis. And, and the greater the um, reports of, of uh, symptom, the greater the symptom um, severity in terms of hallucinations and, and delusions, the greater the impairment in these tasks but contrast sensitivity is not impaired. Okay, so this is what, let's have a few little pictures. So in, the, in our study we had 12 healthy volunteers, most of them were university students, um, had three conditions. i make the point 12 healthy volunteers in Switzerland was very hard to get for 12 healthy volunteers. Um, partly because in Switzerland people are very uh, cautious. And at the time, I actually don't know what the rules are now, but at the time it wasn't that, it wasn't that hard to get these substances. So the feeling was, well, why am I going to do it in the lab if I could do it at home? If I'm that sort of person, I would do it at home. <laughs> and if I'm not that sort of person, it's a very good reason and I don't really want to do that in, the, uh, in a lab. So it was actually genuinely hard to get participants. Um, so we had that every person did three conditions, placebo, low dose and high dose. And people often ask, how high was the high dose because this is in micrograms per kilogram in a um, synthesized uh, synthetic co um, compound. I might, just as an aside, say that the, the actual drugs that we were using was the same batch of psilocybin that was uh, synthesized by Albert Hoffman many, many years ago. They made like a kilo of uh, psilocybin and it was locked away in the Swiss pharmacy bank somewhere, I don't know what they do, but some, some place in Switzerland where they have things that are safe. And uh, the volunteer groups basically asked if they could uh, test it for purity and they showed that, the, that it was 99% pure psilocybin. And as a separate thing they were getting ethics to run the studies but then they uh, got approval to use this, this um, original, this, these original drugs. Anyway, that's an aside but I thought it might be of interest to some people. Um, Anyway, another, just another uh, anecdote to give a sense that these drugs were relatively intense. In one case, I had to move this plant because it had bad intentions. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, the, the other, it was very, it was very, very interesting the degree that, that pretty much everyone had insight into the fact that they were experiencing symptoms. So the person that asked me to move the, the plant said, look, I, I really, I realise this is sort of ridiculous, but it's really giving me the creeps. Can you just move it? Um, <laughs> and another person, uh, so I, I also published this, 
a study looking at working memory and attention, and on the working memory task, they had to push, they, basically these boxes popped up on a screen, and they had to remember the sequence at which the buttons pop, the boxes sort of changed colour, I can't remember exactly what happened. Um, and at one point, um, so the person was rep pushing the, the boxes in the order that the, um, they thought that they'd come up, but they got it wrong. So they basically, had to, you got three chances, I think, at that level, and if you got it wrong three times, you um, it ended, but if you made one mistake, you could keep going. Anyway, so they made one mistake and were furious with the computer. <laughs> and, uh, so to teach the computer a lesson, they made, they purposely got the, did the, the next one incorrectly and then went on to get to the very highest level. So once they saw the computer mistake, they managed to um, perform, you know, nine, a uh, working memory span of nine, which is, it was as high as this, this program went. Anyway, I did like, I did like that. Um, okay, so that's where, where people are at. The other, I think, extremely interesting thing about, anecdotally about this, was every single person that did this study during the placebo thought they were on drugs. Okay? There was a comment earlier about how, how can you, you blind it. I mean, this was not LSD, which is a much more intense um, drug, but if you sit there, if you're ever waiting for a bus or something very boring, you sit there and look at the carpet for five minutes without moving <laughs> and think, am I, is this carpet look the way it's supposed to look? <laughs> okay? Have I, is it possible that things are just a little bit different to how they were before? Every single person in that first half an hour, so this is in this, around 90 minutes people are having, you know, are really reaching the peak. But in that first 30 minutes, every single person said, yeah, I think that could be something. Things are not right. Things are not exactly <laughs> how they're supposed to be. And then at around, you know, they, then at, at some point they were, well, no, they're not. It's not building. Okay, we're still at the point where things might not be exactly how they're supposed to be, but they're not getting more and more unusual. But I found that extremely interesting. People would report genuine perceptual, just, you know, alterations and just things not being quite right. Anyway, um, okay, so this was the main thing. We, we did motion tasks and a range of other tasks and then psychological ratings um, at the end of the, of the motion perceptual tasks. Okay, so this is just to show, this is the um, subjective rating scale that was introduced earlier um, and sort of created by the Volumvita lab. And this just shows that in terms of placebo, so this was, taken, here I said, you know, at this point, this was at the very end after three hours of people that had not been given a substance at that point were f fairly comfortable that they had not taken anything. Um, and then the, the low dose and high dose. The only point here is to make that there was a dose dependency. Okay. Um, okay. So in terms of the contrast sensitivity task, we found that there was no, there was a very, very small, non-significant impairment. Certainly didn't improve things, but basically there was no effect of these drugs on the low-level um, contrast uh, detection mechanisms. So that's a proxy for the sort of the functionality of the low-level visual cortex, the primary visual cortex. Now, in terms of the integration task, there was an impairment, um, significant impairment of psilocybin. Okay, and. Here, all I'm showing here is that the two things were uncorrelated. So uh, there was a significant reduction in coherent sensitivity without any change in uh, motion contrast. Um, so that, yeah, that's all, that's it, done. Now, so what does this tell us? Now, I mentioned before, it, in terms of the anatomy, it really suggests that it, this is, the drugs are affecting more the later visual areas rather than the early visual areas. Um, in terms of sensory processing, the impairments are observed when information needs to be integrated across different brain areas. Now, th this really is the story we're also getting in, um, the, clin in the clinic with uh, um, the psychosis and, and um, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, that basically any task, whether it's visual or otherwise, the more integration required, the greater the um, impairments are. Functionally, visual sen sensitivity is not improved by psilocybin, so things may appear to appear brighter, but they are not. So how can they appear that way? I think that's that, I sort of put that in, but that, I do think that's an interesting question. 
is it's a really, really common report that things, somehow the red is redder than red, somehow the lights are brighter than... But just to say that they are not brighter, well, I mean, at one level that's obvious because it's the light, you know, it's coming from a computer screen that hasn't changed. But what we're testing is not the subjective experience, it's actually the ability to attempt, test these different uh, contrast sensitivities. So it may well be true that people are having a more intense internal experience. So that itself is an interesting question. And I had this hint here um, as a very sort of anecdotal, I don't know, grand way of ending it. Um, I, f I think that one thing that comes out of this is it's not so much that people can't see the forest uh, for the trees, it's they can't see the forest for the leaves. So one thing that people reported, we did some motion, we did a lot of different tasks. Okay, and normally, like I said, when you, people are very, very good at saying, oh, well, I just see this transparent thing. There's all this stuff going in the background, but there's this very clear transparency and I can ignore the background. I mean, it's not a conscious thing, it just happens. The brain just does that, okay? Um, and similarly, we had all this, we had a task you had to track with your, you just pay attention to four different dots moving amongst 20 other dots, which is very difficult to do after taking hallucinogenic drugs. Um, and the consistent self-report was like, it's, it's extremely hard to do this because I can't suppress, I'm paying attention to every dot. I can't not pay attention to every dot. So that becomes an impossible task. We can't, you can't just group 3% of the dots if you're actually unable to suppress the noise perspective. So anyway, I think that is a general take home from, from all of the studies was that, that there might be greater sensitivity to individual components, but the capacity to bind those components was impaired. Okay, so final slide. Um, so the LSD and DMT and psilocybin all share a chemical structure similar to serotonin. I think that itself is very interesting, trying to understand what serotonin is doing in the healthy brain. Um, the vast majority of hallucinogen Hallucinogenics effects, uh, or hallucinogen effects, sorry, are believed to be mediated through the 5-HT2A receptor. Again, I think that's extremely interesting that there's such specificity given how many different receptors there are in the brain. And hallucinogens are currently used successfully and safely for clinical and pure research purposes across the world.